So when we're translating sentences from one language to another, attention kind of makes sense, right? It makes sense that within the context of what we are, have translated so far, that certain parts of the input sentence are of more interest than other parts of this input sentence. Just exactly like if you were translating a sentence from English to some other language that or I'm going to say from another language to English, because that'll be a little more challenging, would be for me. So if I was translating from Russian to English, that the first thing really I'm going to do is say, well, I better find myself a subject, right? So I'm going to kind of search through the Russian to try and find a subject Said, okay, that's important. And let me look for some words kind of on either side of that, right? Because maybe there is an adjective that modifies the subject that actually needs to come first, or an article. No, I, so I remember Russian doesn't have articles, so forget that. But... That, that kind of context. So it matches kind of what we might be doing as humans of we're not just uniformly looking at the entire sentence we want to translate. We are instead focusing on particular parts. Okay? Not with blinders on, just focusing on a single word without caring about anything else, but instead focusing but having peripheral vision of other parts. So that's the idea of this weighted sum of the context, that we have more in the important parts, but we're getting a little bit from the other parts too. This can be used for things other than translation of text. So it can be used, for instance, for image captioning. So image captioning, the idea is we might have something like uh, an image, right? And we might be trying to generate something like a house, and a tree with birds and sun in the sky. So that's the problem of image captioning. And it's a caption, especially if we put it right underneath, right? Makes a nice, nice caption. In order to do this, we've got to have labeled data. So we've got to have images and associated captions. That's important. Okay, so somewhere we've got to create ourselves a labeled data set for that. And then we're going to talk about how we do this training. Okay. There's also the question then of when we're done, how, what's a good way to evaluate how good we have, have done? All right. And we're going to talk about, in fact, in section one, we talked about a measure of this called blue score. And that is going to be up on the, a video that will be available within the next day so that you can see that. But it basically gives, it's kind of like how we look at accuracy for categorical problems, uh, or we look at root mean squared error, let's say for house prices, or maybe root mean squared error of the log of the sale price. Similarly, the blue score can say kind of, how good a caption is this? And it can do that, because the problem is there's a lot of different ways you could caption this, right? A lot of reasonable captions, you know? A house and tree with birds and the sky and a sun overhead. Right, that also might be a valid caption. And there are other valid captions as well. So we want to have some sort of a metric that can be used for evaluation. Not a loss that's used for training, but instead a metric that to us humans makes some sense. And this blue score is such a metric. We're not going to be talking about that anymore now, though. So let's look at some examples. So let's say, for instance, right, our picture is here. And the caption is, a woman is throwing a frisbee in a park. Okay, that's a, a reasonable caption. Now, maybe they're missing out a little bit. You know, what about this guy or gal, right? Maybe there should be, maybe we should mention the trees, maybe we should mention the girl, I don't know, or the, the grass. But it's a, it's a reasonable caption, right? A woman is throwing a frisbee in a park. The other thing I want you to notice, though, is we've done some highlighting of what's the important part here that we're using as we are generating this word. So we already generated a woman is throwing a, and as we're about to translate frisbee, we can see here that this is where the RNN's attention is. Okay? So its attention is on, of all things, the frisbee. Okay? And so that's going to help the RNN generate the word frisbee. So in some sense, we are doing a translation problem, but we're not translating 
from one foreign language to another foreign language. Instead, we're translating, let's say, from a, a visual language to a written language. So this is a visual language representing some abstract, I don't know if I want to say concept, but there's some abstraction here. And what we want to do is extract it into a sentence. All right, so we are going to try and learn how to use attention in this problem. Let's just look at some other images and captions, though. Okay, so here, for example, a dog is standing on a hardwood floor. Now, if you were to, say, rate this caption, is this a great caption, a good caption, or are there any problems with it? Not a very good caption. It's sort of missing the, I guess, it looks like the dog is hiding under a bed, and it's also not standing. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not standing unless characteristics of that dog are very different from what I'm thinking it is, right? So, um, so yeah, a dog is hiding under a bed might be a better, a better choice. But other than the word standing, if we said a dog is lying on a hardwood floor, I mean, it's missing a little bit, but it's relevant. So, but anyway, so as we are generating, we generated an A. We, have a, we don't know what was of interest in the attention of A. My guess is probably still the dog, right? Because we're still talking about a subject here. And A is modifying dog, so probably it was. But what we do know is after we've generated an A, the next most important thing is dog here. So this is where our attention is in this picture. Okay, not on the floor. Well, actually, a little bit on the floor, right? Down here, but mostly for sure in this dog. A little girl is sitting on a bed with a teddy bear. So for both little and girl, we have got our attention out over here. Okay, and actually, it, it to me is still stunning how well neural networks can do, right? The fact that we can actually get a neural network to learn to extract this from an image is, is, is just kind of amazing to me. A uh, giraffe standing in a forest with trees in the background. So what I, I really like about this is we already translated giraffe, right? We're about to translate trees. And so the one thing we do not care about is the giraffe, right? We're done with the giraffe. What we care about is all the stuff outside of the giraffe, which is in fact trees. Or here we actually can see for the progression of the whole sentence what we're going to get as far as attention. So we've got this, looks like a seagull or something over a lake or something. So A is actually looking at, for some reason, the edges of the wings of the bird is right centered on the bird, flying, also bird, but a little, maybe a little more. And then over is kind of interesting because over includes the bird completely, but then also includes down to the bottom, which kind of is an over thing. Uh, A, hard to see what's going on. Body, whatever it is, it's not bird, right? And then of and water, mostly down, but also along the side too, but certainly not bird. So does the idea make sense of why attention is useful? Why focusing on what we're doing can let us ignore parts of the picture and perhaps do a better job? So let's look at how we can do this. So here's what can be done. So this was done about five years ago, I believe. Okay. And so what they did is they took VGG, I believe it was VGT19, pre-trained. Pre-trained on, what do you think it was pre-trained on, Julian? Um, maybe a data set like ImageNet? Yeah, pre-trained on ImageNet, exactly. So it was pre-trained on ImageNet, and actually, we're never going to change it. So there's no fine-tuning that happens. We, we, we could do some fine-tuning by back-propagating all the way back, but we just froze on all those layers. And if you remember VGG19, right, we start out as, let me get my numbers right, we did, so it was 224 by 224 by 3. And then we work our way down doing convolutions and doing max pools to, right, we do like a 112 by 112 by, I don't remember what it was, uh, 64 perhaps. 
and we work our way down till we get to the next to the last. So right before the last max pooling, we have a 14 by 14 by 212. So, sorry, 14 by 14 by 512. This is the layer we're going to take. So this is fairly abstract. Okay, so we're going to have by 512. So this might be the layer, for instance, that we have chosen to do style transfer if we were using uh, VGG for, actually we did use VGG for style transfer, didn't we? So this might be, in fact, the, the same one we used, but it is close to the end. So we've gone through a lot of abstraction from low-level features to higher, to higher, to higher, to higher, to higher. But we still have spatial information associated with it, right? So we know, for instance, if we look at this guy here, I'm going to call this A1,1. So A1,1 is this entire 1 by 1 by 512. So we have 512 different features associated with the top left. Now, the receptive field of A11 is probably fairly large with a NER224 by 224. Okay. But it's uh, centered sort of at the top left. The, you know, on the other side of things, we have an A1414, which is also one by one by 512. And that represents things towards the bottom right of the original image. So we have here spatial representations that do refer spatially to the original image. So if we had the bird, and the bird were in the middle right, of this image, then it may be we would have be using activations in the center here. We would be attending to activations in the center and not attending to ones on the edges. So we're really going to be learning then weightings to use for each of these 14 by 14 different 1 by 1 by 512 activations. So we've got, what is it, 200 and, it's 14 by 14, 296, I think. 14 by 14, 1 by 1 by 512 activations. And we are going to weight each of these as we're outputting every word. So let's look from the top down. Context of T, just as we looked at when we were doing translation, so context sub T is going to be the context from the image that we need to generate word T. So we're going to have a context 1, a context 2, a context 3, and so on. So as we move through the caption, we're going to be getting different contexts. And the contexts are just going to be a weighted sum over all i and j, i and j in the 14 by 14. And we're going to look at the weighting. We're going to look at the weighting both so T and I comma J, and we're going to multiply that by A sub I comma J. So A sub I comma J is this 1 by 1 by 512, and we're going to do weighted sums of all these 1 by 1 by 512s. So if we are, uh, have high weights for things in the middle, then if this was a bird image and the bird is in the middle, then we're going to be getting mostly bird activation here and much less of other type activations. Does this make sense so far, how this gives us this spatial context? Are you asking if it makes sense to me or? <laughs> yes, I am asking if it makes sense to you. I'm not asking you to, to regurgitate it all. Um, I guess, hmm, I think I think so. I get the, the A, I, uh, I comma J. I'm a little less clear what's going on with the alpha. So this is going to be how important A sub IJ is, and we haven't yet fixed, figured that out. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to come up with a softmax basically here, where some of the AIJs are going to be more important, and some of the AIJs are going to be less important for this particular word that we're generating. But, 
But yeah, at the point right now, it's just through a mechanism we will discuss, we'll figure out how to determine what the importance is. But once we've determined the importance, we're going to do this kind of expectation of a sub ij based on these probabilities. You know, if we think of this as the probability that a sub ij, a, that a sub ij is important to generate word t, then we're doing this uh, expectation or weighted sum. Okay, so what we're going to do is just very similar to what we did in the tra translation case. So we are going to have a neural network. This neural network is going to be shallow. So it's a one-level neural network. And we are going to feed in two things that are of importance, sorry, two things to decide whether a sub ij is going to be useful for generating word t. Okay? The one thing that we'll feed in will be a sub ij itself. So we'll feed in this one by one by 512. We'll go through, of course, and do each of them. But for a particular ij, we're going to feed in one of these. And then the second thing we feed in is we want to know, right, so let's just say again, alpha. So alpha i sub j equals, let's, let's call it the probability that a sub ij is important in generating. So that's what alpha is going to be. The two things we would need in order to determine whether it's important or not. Well, one thing, let's look at AIJ itself. All right, let's just try and look and see. Does AIJ tend to show birdness or little girlness or dogness or badness or hardwood floors or anything else, right? So there may be something in here that's kind of telling us what's in that particular location, right, at a fairly high abstract level. And then the second thing we need to know was which word are we at, right? Where are we in the word generation process? If this is English, the first few words are probably going to be the subject. And so that's going to be much different, what we would try to gather from here, than if we're at the 10th word, let's say, where we've already generated a whole phrase and we know where we're at. So the other thing we're going to feed in is our h sub t minus 1, right? We have an RNN. Our RNN is our captioning RNN. Our captioning RNN gets fed in context t and also gets fed in what else does it get fed in does it oh it's for the caption RN. does it also get fed in i guess the previous hidden state okay so the previous hidden state is going to be coming in here so that's going to be let's call it h sub what t minus one agreed and it's going to be spitting out a sub t. Yep, and if it's an LSTM, there's also a C that's going along with it, right? But let's ignore that for now. And then what else does it get as input, actually? So what else do we get as input to this RNN? Sorry, I'm not sure. So what we need is the previous word we spit out, right? Because if we look, right, we've, we've already done t minus one time steps. We got out probability distributions, right? We got out softmaxes for what we're to generate. But a softmax, it's still up to whoever called the RNN to determine what word to actually output. And so therefore, we need to know, we know at all the previous time steps what words have been output. And now we know the last time step happened, t minus one happened, t minus one generated, a probability distribution, and now some code decided outside of the RNN what word to generate from that. It might be the greedy one, right, the highest probability. It might have flipped a coin, weighted on these probabilities. But in any case, we output a word. So in fact, if we go back here, so a woman is throwing A. We had already generated a woman is throwing. On the last time step, we got out a probability distribution, and there was some probability of A, and we happened to choose it. Now we need to tell it, hey, the last one we did was A. You know all the previous words that were generated because we fed those in at previous time steps, but you need to know what this last word was. Okay? So this is language generation specific. It has nothing to do in particular with image captioning specifically. What is this output? That would be outputting 
the probability of the next word, right? Yeah, so let's just call that y hat sub t, where this is a probability distribution. It doesn't know what word we're going to generate, right? So uh, the last word was a. Frisbee's high up there, probably, but it might also be trademark sensitive and instead uh, have suggested disk instead. Uh, and so it didn't know what it was, so we will tell it on the next time step what it is. So this is what our RNN looks like at a given time step. Wt minus 1 will have some algorithm based on y hat sub t minus 1. So greedy, beam, probabilistic. We know h sub t minus 1 is coming in. Can we use h sub t to generate context sub t? I think so. So here's the problem. Context of t is an input to this, and h sub t is an output. So we don't actually have h sub t at the time we're generating context of t. Could we use h sub t minus 1? Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Yep, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to feed out h sub t minus 1, put this in our big neural network, do some computation to come up with context t. So this is our one-layer neural network, which is right over here. So that's why we have a sub t minus 1 coming in here and a sub ij coming in here. And our output is going to be... Context t? Uh, it will be a factor in context of t. So it's not going to directly be context t because we're going to call this neural network for every ij pair. So we're going to call it for 1, 1, all the way to 1, 7, all the way to 14, 14. So call this neural network over and over and over and over again. So it's giving us something inside here. What's it giving us inside here? Alpha. It's giving us alpha almost directly, right? It's actually going to give us energy of t comma i comma j. And we're going to feed that through softmax. And that's going to give us alpha t at i comma j. So we call this neural network 296 times for every one of these, we get all these 296 E's, and then we throw them all in a softmax. That gives us our probabilities. These probabilities are these probabilities. Now we do our weighted sum, because we have these, we have these. We do our weighted sum, that's our context, and that gets fed, fed into here. So some stuff happens in here. So feeding into our neural network is basically our CNN, right? We've got one layer of the output from our CNN that's feeding into our neural network. It's feeding into the neural network, and then it also feeds into the calculation of context T, because we're feeding in the neural network here, and we're also feeding it into our calculation of context T. So I imagine there are questions. Who can give me one? I have a question. Um, shoot, 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 shoot. You, one level, uh, neural net that ends up being really, really big, right? Let's see. Aij is going to be 512, right? And h is going to be whatever our memory happens to be here. So it's actually not going to be that big, right? E is just going to be a single number. So this is probably going to be, you know, 500 or 1,000, 1,000 by one neural network. That's, oh, that's right, right. Okay. I forgot that E was just a single number. That makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Other questions? So as we're computing our loss, right, we're going to compute our loss. It's going to involve these y hats. Those are going to feed back and update our weights in our RNN or LSTM. And those are then going to continue to propagate back through the context and back into our one-layer neural network, and could feed, in fact, back into the CNN, into the layer we're at, plus earlier layers. In our case, as far as the paper was concerned, it doesn't because this CNN was frozen. But you can imagine this CNN might be generating features that are okay for doing captioning, but not really perfectly suited. You can imagine with some fine-tuning, maybe the CNN would learn to generate better features here that were more crisply defined for doing captioning as opposed to classification on a thousand different types. So 
just as we did in, gosh, lab one, right? The first week, or the first day even, I think we did rhinos and giraffes, right? So for rhinos and giraffes, we got rid of the classification into a thousand categories. We added classification of rhinos and giraffes, which are not uh, one of the thousand categories it had been trained for. And then we used VGG, I believe. We kept going down to seven by seven by something or other, and then into a couple fully connected layers. But we got rid of those fully connected layers, and all we had really was our seven by seven, and then we went to a new fully connected layer. Train that. But then we did fine tuning. And the fine tuning was basically, these might not have been ideally suited for distinguishing rhinos from giraffes. There might be some slight tweaks that could be done to better make a full network that does that. Similar here, there might be tweaks that we can make to the CNN to make it better able to caption. But you can do a lot without even doing any fine tuning of this. Can we live without fine tuning this? Um, no, because it's not pre-trained. Yeah, so if it's not pre-trained, we're going to have just have random alphas, right, that happen to sum to one. So its attention is going to be, who knows, you know, like a, like a three-year-old darting around from, you know, place to place. Uh, uh, not very useful. So we definitely have to train the neural network, and we definitely have to train our RNN here. What would be a good RNN to start with here? Is there any transfer learning that we could do? Transfer learning in the RNN? Yep. I'm not sure. Well, when we're generating captions, do we want it to be good English? Yes. Are there models that know a lot about English? Yes. And they are called? Language models. Language models. So this would be a perfect case to start with a language model, right, and then do some transfer learning. So we actually are transfer learning two different things. Right? We're transfer learning a language model for doing the captioning, and we're also transfer learning this classification problem. We're ripping off the classification part, but we're using the remainder of the model to extract useful information from an image, to, to get an abstract representation of what's going on. So it's kind of cool. We could maybe first freeze the language model and the CNN, uh, the only thing that we would be updating, so we'd have a softmax here for our y hat and a output matrix that would be, you know, a, a linear matrix that would be untrained. So a linear that's untrained and our NN that's untrained. We train for a while to train those, and then we fine-tune the whole thing. It makes some sense. Uh, but actually, in this particular problem, it's interesting, right, so this was, I think I said, about five years ago. Five years ago, it was very common to do transfer learning with CNNs and very uncommon to do transfer learning with RNNs. It just, for some reason, just hadn't been thought of that having a language model would be really good if you're doing it with language. Just like having a ImageNet trained classifier would be really good if you're doing much with images. So the paper I was talking about, this RNN was completely untrained. It may have been using some pre-trained embed word embeddings. I'm not sure. There's one other thing that was done in this paper. They adjusted the loss function. So the idea is, that they had was they want to make sure that the model looks at the entire image at some point. And there's, there's nothing so far that requires that, right? It could be that we have an image and alpha, that the middle of the image is where the attention is for every word, right? That could be. And so the authors decided that they wanted to force the model to use the entire image at some point. Okay, and in fact, evenly, we want to basically, across the entire caption that's generated, it has used the entire area evenly. How, how could we do something like that? What would it even mean that we've used the entire area equally across all words? Do you see entire area instead of just like the single chunks? Well, we know we've broken the area, right? So we've broken it up into these 
296 different chunks. How can we ensure that each chunk is used evenly throughout all the words? How can we even measure that would be a, maybe a better question. Can we like check, can we just like have some tally of like what the actor, what the alpha was for each value? Okay, we know all the alphas, T, we know all the alphas for every T and every IJ. So is there something we can represent mathematically with respect to those that kind of would say, yeah, go ahead. Like an array of like, or like a matrix, of like how much percentage of the time the alpha is above a threshold or just some kind of product of that? Let's look. So what does, so when we look at the summation over all ij and we look at a particular, what do we know about that summation? We know. For a given t? For a given t, it will sum to one. Yep, this sums to one by definition of the softmax, right? So we've got our probabilities of attending to a particular area and the totality of those probabilities sums to one. What does this mean for a fixed ij? What does this measure? So if, if t is, so you're summing over all the t's, so you're measuring yes, for each, you're measuring for each icon, so each cell, you're measuring how much it was used for all, all the words, I guess. How much it was used. Yeah, and if it were, if we used every cell exactly evenly across our entire output, what would this sum to? If it was used evenly, then it would be one again. Yeah, so we know this and we kind of are pushing towards this. That's the idea that the authors have, is that we know this is true. We'd like to push to make sure there aren't parts of this that just aren't used very much. Now, as I think about this, right, the intuition sort of makes sense and sort of doesn't, right? If I've got a bat surrounded by all black, when I think of this, should the bat and all the black patches all be evenly used across this? I don't know. I guess that would tend to, if you just had a bat as your caption, almost by definition, it'd mostly be focused on the bat. But if you had a bat on a black background, then I guess overall you would be even, right? So maybe doing doing that and making sure your attention spreads everywhere across your whole sentence ensures that you're completely describing what's going on everywhere in the picture. Maybe that's the, the intuition. How can you push towards, maybe a better word would be something like encourage, right? How do we do encouragement? Loss function, some kind of. Exactly, the loss function. So we are gonna modify the loss function to encourage this. Let's look at how we do that. So let's look at the loss. So our loss is going to be equal. Well, we're going to use, right, minus the log of... Here, we're going to be using the uh, binary cross-entropy loss. So basically, if the word is supposed to be bat, uh, and our probability of bat is 0.9, then we're going to use minus log of 0.1 um, for that, right? If the probability of bat we generated was 0.1 or 0.3, then we are 0.7 away from our 1, so we'd use minus log of 0.7. So I'm going to just not even write that in here right now. I'm going to just say this is the binary cross-entry B piece that we would expect. Right, and this is the binary cross entropy summed across all t. Okay, so we're going to look at how well you did on word one, on word two, or word three, all the way to word t. And then we're going to add in some additional penalty for not being close to one. Okay, so the farther this is away from one, the more the penalty. So we're going to do something like a summation across all the locations, all the cells. And for each cell, we're going to look and see how well we did. So we're going to take the summation over all the, all the words of 
going to make this 1 minus. Because if I do summation minus 1, it's unclear whether the 1 is part of the summation or not. So this, this squared. Okay, so this is, for a given ij, how close was the total alpha across all time steps to our desired one. All right, and what's our beta? Like what would be a good value for beta, or like what's the scaling? No, no, but okay, it's a scaling factor. That, that's really all I wanted. Yeah, so this is a scaling factor, and uh, what kind of a thing is this? Is it a learned parameter? It would be a hyperparameter. Yep, hyperparameter, exactly. So one of the things you have to tune to make this work. So where we are going to go from here is looking at doing sequence to sequence, like language translation, with no recurrent neural net. All right. We're going to instead just be using attention. So we're just basically going to be saying, as we are generating every word, for all of the source words, which of them look like they are of interest? And then do the same thing for the next word, the next word, the next word. That's, that's kind of it. Um, although we're going to piece it together in, in a more complicated way. So sort of like we have a multi-layer recurrent neural network that is learning more and more abstract things, we're going to have a multi-layer attention network. And the other interesting thing is there's been some work now in attention in doing things like ImageNet classification, not using a concurrent neural network, instead just using attention. So attending to various parts of the input image in order to then determine what the final classification is, but not having convolutions at all. So any questions about this? My hope is that what you learned in, in this talk is really by looking at another example of attention, I hope it helped cement the knowledge of how this attention works. Because the attention as we did it here is not terribly different from the attention in the language translation. Okay, what we're attending to is different, right? What we, we attended to in the language translation is words in the input. What we attended to in this case was cells or areas in our processed image. Okay, but you could also imagine attention attending to pixels in a, an individual input. Questions? I, I guess like conceptually, I don't understand why you'd want to force the model to look at like every point in the image like evenly wouldn't like above some threshold so you're like considering every point but not necessarily like equally weighting for example like a random tree in a background versus like a bunch of people that are like the main focus of the image i could certainly see that so i could see and and maybe our beta will enable us to get that right so as we're doing this mean squared error right if, if we're looking kind of the the error is the difference from one um, maybe if you're at 0.9 or 1.1, it's not going to matter too much. But as you get to be higher and higher away from one, it's going to matter more and more. But conceptually, what you're saying makes sense, right? Wanting everything to be exactly even. Um, it's, it, for those of you who have siblings, right? Uh, I'll tell you, your parents were probably annoyed when the siblings want to be treated exactly equal. It's like, that's so hard, you know? Roughly equal is always good. It was good enough for me. Um, but yeah, if you've got some lone image in the back, well, you know what I can imagine? I can imagine also, maybe what you just want to say is for at least one word, you gave serious consideration to each area for at least one word, right? So maybe, they, maybe instead what you want to say is that for, yeah, for at least one T, IJ was greater than 0.25. Um, yeah, I had a question. Sorry this w if this was stated earlier, but I'm a little unclear as to why our loss function is using binary cross-entropy. In As far as measuring the loss. 
So we're going to measure the loss of the first word, the loss of the second word, the loss of the third word, the loss of the fourth word, and so on. And the loss is really just, is this one right or not right? So the closer it is to one, the less the loss, the closer it is to zero, the higher the loss. And we don't care about any, the probabilities of any of the other words, except the word it's supposed to be. So if the words was supposed to be Frisbee, I don't care what probability you gave disc or gave golf ball or anything else. All that matters is what was the probability that the model gave it to Frisbee. Let me just back up a second. This looks good for everything but the word binary. What if I were to say cross entropy? Would that make more sense? So we normally... I was saying, I think my issue is that I was thinking binary cross entropy was used for just binary classes, and technically this is one of many classes. Um, if we're thinking about like categorizing it as one word, but... Let's, let's just use the... Uh, cross entropy. Yeah, I had a question about um, when we were making the um, the neural network for captioning. Um, I think I was a little confused about like we had context. We had it. Like, we had the context sub t first coming from the one layer neural network, but then like looks like we erased that and said made it come from the CNN. So I was just trying to figure out what was going on there. Ah, uh -huh. no, so let's look at that. So the CNN, right, so what happens should be this. Right, so we have our CNN, uh, which gives us out, actually, our 14 by 14 by 512. The sum, a, and each one of these is an A sub IJ, right? Each one of these little 1 by 1 by 512s. So the context at time step t is the weighted sum over all ij's. We just take each of these 14 by 14 and go through and weight them by alpha and then do our a sub ij. So this, yeah, let's, this goes into the RNN along with w sub t minus 1 and h sub t minus 1, okay? But our alpha comes from our neural network, spits out E, which turns into alpha via softmax. And our neural network input is A sub IJ feeds in there, and H sub T minus 1 feeds in. CNN comes up with a set of 14 by 14 A sub IJs. Each, each A sub IJ feeds into the neural network along with an H sub T minus 1. So from the RNN, what's the last state? They feed in, we get an E. We do that for every possible A sub IJ for a given time step, H sub T minus 1. Once we get all those E's, we feed them in the softmax, we get out our alphas, we sum them together, that gives them a context T. We feed that into the RNN. We go to the next time step. Would it be accurate to have like um, an arrow from like the one layer and a neural net to the context and an arrow from the CNN to the context since they both kind of contribute to the... Uh, sure. Yeah, the CNN and the RNN. Yeah, so let's look at a sort of a high-level diagram then. So the CNN goes into a neural net, and then that goes out to an RNN, and the RNN also feeds into the neural net. So this is time step t minus 1, and this is time step t. Is that, is that what you're thinking? Something like that? I think it's like, so I have like the context going into the RNN, but I yes. have arrows from both the neural net and the CNN going into the context. If that makes sense, because like, the context is made with both alpha and A sub IJ. So alpha is part of the context. Alpha comes from the neural net, and the RNN feeds into that. So the RNN 
from the previous time step affects the context at the next time step. Yeah. Right, so if I have, let's see, you know, a woman is throwing, it's really important to know that what I've generated so far is a woman is throwing. Because given the picture we saw before, what's the next word going to be probably? Frisbee, a frisbee, a. Frisbee, a frisbee, probably a frisbee. Yeah, something like that. But where's our intention going to be? Our intention, well, so the a frisbee doesn't work, doesn't, or what, I guess in the image it would be on the frisbee. Yeah, in the image it's going to be on the frisbee. So that's what we know given we have just generated this. Now, let's say we, so this is possibility one. Possibility two, let's say here's what we've generated so far. A frisbee is thrown by, and now we're going to generate. Where's our attention going to be? Uh, the woman. The woman. So it's really important to know our memory from an RNN, and that's going to be key in figuring out our alpha because our alpha is dependent not just on what's in the picture, but also where we are in generation and where we've been actually is even more. Where we've been in generation, all of our history of generation. Does that help? It does, yeah. I think I'm just, I'm having things like point into context, like what pieces are needed to make the context sub T. Okay, and so what's needed is? I have, I have both the one layer neural net and the CNN pointing to it because the one layer neural net makes the alphas and the oh. CNN makes the A. And the CNN A's. makes the A, perfect. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering if that made sense. Exactly right. Okay. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. And the RNN then points into the... Yeah, the, the, the H sub T minus one points into the one layer neural net. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. And that's the key. If HT pointed in, we'd have a problem because we couldn't compute HT without having HT and you know we'd have a chicken and egg issue.